Hello there. So the health emergency was not severe enough to fast track the cure, but was severe enough to order everyone to stay at home and totally cripple the economy. Now Richard has an extremely important question for you at the end of this video. The muddled up thinking emerging from these Telegraph WhatsApp Hancock files does make you question the ability of those we elect to actually do anything joined up. And it's this type of information leaking out that gets people thinking that maybe we need some grown-ups running our healthcare system and our reactions to future health emergencies. Maybe it will be postulated, just maybe the answer is to plonk the whole of the nation's healthcare problems in the lap of an expert supranational organisation like, I don't know, the World Health Organisation maybe. After all, there is a plan in the form of an international treaty handily waiting in Westminster to be signed off and rubber stamped by politicians to make just that happen. To hand our medical sovereignty over to the WHO. How timely and convenient that is. But that aside, we now hear that Professor Sir Chris Whitty informed the then Health Secretary Matt Hancock and others that an illness with a less than 1% mortality rate, a rate that, as I understand it, the recent health emergency at the time had, that an illness with a less than 1% mortality rate would need a very safe medical intervention, not a fast-tracked one. And he went further, saying it has to be very safe so the safety studies can't be shortcut, so important for the long run. So, of course, the government followed that advice and went slowly but surely, didn't they? But it seems the politicians were after a more instant solution, more hair than tortoise. So it's amazing that by going slowly and surely and safely, the UK was still able to beat the odds with a very, very fast rollout. We showed Israel, the EU and the US Operation Warp Speed a thing or two, didn't we? And one Dominic Cummings seemed very keen to do this, with his later talk that we should have gone even faster and engaged in human challenge trials. So to me it sounds like it was fast-tracked. And now we hear that the mortality rate was less than 1%. So slow and steady should have been the order of the day. But as I said, as far as I can see, we did fast-track it. Otherwise, how come we false started so quickly out of the rollout blocks to beat so many others to the finish line? And on top of that, we ended up, like so many countries around the world, forcing certain sections of our society to take it to keep their jobs or to travel, with the obvious aim of a national law later down the line to make it compulsory for all, including children, twice a year. Once they could make it stick, that is. And the only saving grace was that Keir Starmer's more stay-at-home, more interventionist Labour Party wasn't in power to do that dirty deed. Now, if the situation did not warrant a fast-track process for a medical intervention, then why the stay-at-home orders? Why the trashing of the economy? Why the disruption of education? Why the psychological warfare waged by government on the people of this country? Why the use of the likes of the 77 Brigade, among others, to monitor and deal with dissent? Why the censorship and the shutting down of expert voices that questioned the official narrative? And why the dodgy reporting system that amplified the illness and death numbers? And why was the adverse reaction system so underreported? Why the need for one big pharma company to attempt to lock up certain data for many decades? Why the need to redact and hide away all the contracts that government signed on our behalf? And still people are vilified for merely asking questions 
and the censorship remains. While those that ended up pushing all of this are the ones that will walk away with the honours and the money. Now this whole episode smacks to me of ego fueled politicians and maybe some scientists and one prominent advisor all trying to beat other governments to the prize of being the first. The first during a global emergency that would put them in their history books. Rushing around to sign up to any contract for anything that looked like PPE or sounded like a possible medical intervention. Contracts where the taxpayer forks out with a real prospect of never seeing a return for it. And ignoring other more well-established things as well. And as a result of all of this, people were whipped into a frenzy of terror and screaming for a cure from within their prison homes. And now that the questions are being asked, governments don't even want to investigate it properly in case we find the wrong originating at ground zero. And the willful misuse of taxpayers' money. And possibly that the cure did more damage than the ailment did. And doesn't that sound to you exactly like their approach to the whole net zero thing too? Richard. So, today at Prime Minister's Questions, Rishi Sunak was grilled over the Matt Hancock WhatsApp leaks. Oh, wait, he wasn't, was he? Well, why not? Why didn't the opposition tear him a new one? It was an open goal, for goodness sake. Well, that will tell you all you need to know about the fairness of our political system, which is nothing more than theatrically managed opposition that remains in a constant state of flux as the red and blue battle out their agendas to work towards the same agenda. Mm. Yeah, Keir Starmer was never going to go hammer and tongs at Matt Hancock because both Keir Starmer and Matt Hancock are World Economic Forum stooges. Yes, both are compromised in their positions. And as for the leaks themselves, they also serve a purpose, as did the parties at, you know, the Christmas parties at number 10. They served a purpose. The question is, what is that purpose? Now, as many of you know, I have a little conspiracy theory that Boris Johnson was trying to discredit the government by allowing such parties and attending them in order to, uh, well, to end the lockdowns and end the mandate push that was going on at the time. But there's also another explanation, and that's only revealed by looking at much larger outcomes that are unfolding. You see, it's very simple. Discredit the UK state and all other global states, so the disenfranchised masses will run to a global state and a global leader. Yes, all unified. This is all about control, and nearly all our political options within this facade that we call democracy, appear to be working together. This managed collapse of our rotten political system is all too convenient, and the way the cards are falling shows exactly what's going on. I mean, do you honestly think that Labour, who supported most of the government's decisions during the uh, global medical emergency, would now meaningfully criticise how those decisions were reached? Starmer is complicit in this, as are all MPs who did not stand up against the stay-at-home rules and mandates that destroyed so many people's lives and killed and continues to kill so many. OK, I digress, and I want you all to consider where this is going. You see, the question is, who would this hypothetical global world leader be? Would he be, well, I don't know, who would he be? Well. He would most certainly be a key figure in the world's most influential organisation, and that is the public face of evil itself, which is the WEF. But who? Well, if you're going to have a global leader, it would be handy if he could unify the world's two most warring factions, and that is Islam and Judaism, so that unification has meaning and is grounded. So what attributes would this global leader require to facilitate such a unification? Well, I would say someone who is directly descended from both the main prophet of Islam and also from King David. Ah, if only such a person existed. Oh, wait, 
there is someone who may fit that very bill. King Charles. <laughs> yeah, outlandish. Totally. But uh, have a Google of it. Just have a Google on Charles's lineage and let me know what you think in the comment section below.